Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Coming home after work, a husband found an emotionally distressed wife. Today's story with a similar plot. Enjoy watching it. My name is Richard Donnelly, but everyone calls me Rick. I am the son of James and Aaron Donnelly, yes, 100% Irish from South Boston. I have a hot temper, an iron jaw, and fists calloused from many fights. Yes, I'm the stupid idiot from Southey. I grew up in South Boston, where the Irish Mafia was in control. Several films were even made about it, but these movies barely scratched the surface of the situation. Damn it, life hasn't been easy. Mom and Dad did everything they could, but school was still terrible. I had a few close friends, but they were always stupid. I was never one to shy away from a fight and usually ended up either in the nurse's office or suspended from school. It took me two tries to graduate from 8th grade because of idiots who picked fights with me. I won more than I lost, and I'm proud of it. But no matter what, I promised my mother that I would not use or sell illegal substances. Why did I make this promise to her? The answer is simple, she died of breast cancer. By the time doctors discovered it, she was already in stage 4, and there was nothing they could do for her. I made that promise to her on her deathbed, right before I started high school. Dad took mom's death very hard, he quickly found solace in the bottom of a whiskey bottle every damn night. Luck of the Irish, what a damn funny joke. If you want to know what the luckiest day of my life was, it was the day I was arrested at age 18 for assault and battery. The idiot I beat up tried to rob an old lady, O'Connor, not in my area, damn it. I think if I had stopped hitting him when he finally let go of the bag, I wouldn't have been charged. Was I that smart? You already know the answer to this. The cops pulled me off the idiot and handcuffed me anyway. To shorten the long story a little, I only got six months in jail for this fight, thanks to the witnesses who confirmed that I was simply helping our area matriarch. The judge wanted to make an example of me. Hey, it could be worse. It's strange, but in prison, I fought much less often than in the wild. On the first day, I fought with one guy, after that, they left me alone. How do you like that, huh? While I was inside, life hit me over the head again. My father died. His grandparents found him after he didn't answer his phone for two days, and they went to check what was wrong. They told me he drank three bottles of Jameson, and that was the end of it. He never got over his mom's death, and I hoped they would be reunited in heaven. At least I was allowed to go to the funeral. Yes, it was very painful, but that's when I met Miss Murphy. Miss Amelia Murphy was an elderly black lady who worked as a prison counselor. She was strict, but deep down, she had a heart of gold. After a lot of talking about my problems, she asked if I had any hobbies. When I told her that I liked computers because I fixed my dad's PC several times before he died, she asked if I wanted to get trained on them. I happily agreed. She organized everything for me for the time after my release. She talked to my grandparents about it and said that the city of Boston would pay half of my tuition, they paid the other half with my test scores from prison education. I was able to finish my junior year and stay out of trouble my senior year, too. Miss Murphy remained in my life even after I was released from prison. She and her daughter, Alicia, became frequent guests at my grandparents for dinner on Sundays after evening mass. Alicia was a year older than me, and I sometimes went to their house so that she could help me with my studies. It didn't hurt that she was damn attractive. Nothing really happened between us, I think it was because of the racial barrier or whatever they call it. I was afraid to ask her out, thinking that she would refuse me. For the record, she looked like Naomi King, but taller. I eventually started to consider her my best friend. She already considered me one of her best friends, so that made everything easier. After my release, I moved in with my grandparents, the McKinnons, my mother's parents. My dad's parents died before I was born, so I never knew them. During my senior year, I had a breakout season in baseball and received a full scholarship to the University of Florida. I thought my luck was finally starting to turn. My mom and dad always taught me how to treat women properly. They taught me that if a lady is in trouble, you should do everything you can to help her. So, in my first year as a gator, I found myself in yet another fight, which resulted in my first date with Sophie Randall. Damn, she was hot. 
Sophie most often wore her long red hair in a ponytail. When some frat jerks tried to get her to come with them and she refused, I couldn't help but intervene. They were just unlucky that I had just finished baseball practice and was walking back to the dorm with a bat in my hands. I know what you're thinking, no, I never looked for trouble, trouble found me on its own. In this case, I had no intention of allowing Sophie to be violated. No, I wasn't trying to say something cliche like let the girl go. I hate cliches. Besides, why warn idiots? This doesn't make any sense, really. If anyone has a problem with me not fighting fairly, they can go to hell. Sophie called campus security, their first action was to handcuff me. Of course, I was already familiar with police procedures, but Sophie smoothed things over with a few statements. She identified me as the one who saved her after those idiots tried to grab her behind the dumpster. I looked where she pointed, and sure enough, there was a container there. They planned to take her there. Well, at least they didn't get to her. Once they filled out their reports and took our names and student ID numbers, they let us go. In turn, they handcuffed the frat jerks and called the local cops to come take them away. Are you okay? Those idiots didn't hurt you? I asked. I'm fine, thanks, she replied in a southern accent, smiling as I stood nearby. Your eye socket will need attention. Why don't you come to my dorm, and I'll get you some ice for your eyes. I'm going to be a nurse, so you're in good hands. What's your name, sir? I laughed at her words. My name is Rick Donnelly, not sir. I already know you're Sophie Randall. We take English 101 together. Exactly. You're the new shortstop, right? It's me. Are you a baseball fan? Are you kidding? I love the devil rays. Sophie replied, making me smile. Super cute, smart, and loves baseball, hell yes. Now, let's go. Where are you from? Boston, I said, smiling as we walked toward her dorm. South Boston, if that matters. So, you're a Yankee, she snorted, looking at me with mock disgust. When I raised my eyebrow, she laughed slightly and winked at me. Don't worry, honey. I like your accent. It's cute. Well, your accent is charming as hell, I replied before my internal filter could kick in. Oh, what a flatterer you are, she laughed again. Sorry about that. I blush easily. Sometimes I don't have a filter, where I come from, we're pretty straightforward. I think straightforward is an understatement. Rick, don't worry about it. I like straightforwardness, it shows that you are honest. Let's head upstairs, we've arrived. Of course, while we were walking and talking, we had already approached her dorm. I looked at my watch and saw that it was just after 9 p.m. I remembered from orientation that the curfew in the dorm was at 10 o'clock. Lead the way, I shrugged. When we got to her room, she gave me an ice pack and a towel and I put it on my eye. So, what's your story, honey? Sophie asked as she handed me some patches. My green eyes met her blue ones and I ran my hand through my reddish-brown hair. I felt that I needed to be completely honest with her. I told her about my life in South Boston and how things had gone so far. I didn't miss a single important detail, I even told her about my time in prison. It wasn't easy for you, she said sympathetically. That's one way to put it, I shrugged with a laugh. Then I opened my big mouth again. I hope you don't mind me saying this, but you're incredibly beautiful. Unbelievable, she said, raising her eyebrows with an expression of mixed surprise and amusement. Sorry, incredibly means absolutely or truly, as in, you're really stunning. Well, thanks, Rick, she said, blushing. You're incredibly cute yourself. I prefer manly and handsome with a face full of character, but I guess I can settle for cute. I shrugged again, then she stunned me by kissing me. She giggled and took the ice pack from the bed gently pressing it back to my eye. Then she leaned down and kissed me again. Now just hold it in place, got it? You're right, I replied, holding the bag. I then looked around the room, noticing that the other bed wasn't even in use. Don't you have a roommate? She giggled again. No, looks like I got lucky. The girl who was supposed to live with me was expelled before I got here. 
Nobody said why. Damn, you're luckier than me. I laughed and shook my head. Well, Mr. Donnelly, she said, giving me a playful smile while biting her bottom lip. I think your luck will soon change for the better, and mine too. The next three years went by quickly, but in a good way. Mostly, the frat jerks who attacked Sophie were expelled because, surprise surprise, it wasn't their first time trying. In fact, Sophie's incident turned out to be their third warning, stupid idiots. Sophie and I started dating, and I became very successful in baseball. What can I say? I know how to handle a bat, no pun intended. I also had success with Sophie, most of our dates went great, and our intimacy was amazing. But then I discovered the darker side of my fiery-haired love. Do you know the expression redhead, fire in bed? Well, she also had fire in her head. Even though her eyes were blue, they turned an angry green when she saw me talking to another woman. The first time, we had a huge fight. I stood my ground while she called me anything but a child of God. I made it clear to her that if she couldn't trust me, then it was over between us. So, I left her. No, I didn't cheat on her, I thought she already knew that. By the end of her sophomore year, I used the time after we broke up to get my CompTIA A+, Network+, Security+, and Server+, certifications. These tests are incredibly difficult, but I passed them all. At least it took my mind off the turmoil my personal life had become. Sophie and I didn't speak for five weeks until she sent me a message asking to meet. I seriously considered telling her to go to hell. Maybe, looking back, I should have done that, but damn, I couldn't predict the future. I was young, stupid, and damned if I didn't still love her. When I met her at our usual place, she sat down next to me and didn't look at me for a long time. When it became obvious that I wouldn't say anything, she spoke up. I'm sorry, Rick, she whispered. I'm sorry for what I said after I saw you talking to that person. Okay, I said. Sophie, if you don't trust me, there's nothing I can say or do to change that. Since you never asked, Kate was telling me that she and Ted wanted to invite us to their engagement party. I had to go alone because you don't trust me. By the way, Kate is not a person. You should have known that. Then she surprised me when tears flowed from her eyes. She covered her face with her hands and burst into tears. My heart was breaking, so I leaned over and put my arm around her shoulders. I'm so, so sorry, Rick, she sobbed, hugging me with both arms. I should have trusted you. Honey, I will from now on, I promise. Please give me one more chance. You will not regret it. Why don't you trust me? I asked, now curious. Do you remember when I told you about my mom and dad's divorce? She asked. Yes, but you never said why, I remembered. Dad cheated on mom, she sobbed, looking straight into my eyes. When I told my mom that I was dating you, she said that all the damn Yankees are the same. Dad is originally from New York. Well, I'm not from New York, I snorted with disdain. Yes, you know about the Boston-New York rivalry, right? If you don't, get out from under your rock. I know that, honey, she said, tears still streaming down her face. But mom didn't stop talking about how you would end up doing the same to me. She was sure that you would cheat on me or betray me somehow. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I listened to her. You have to trust me, Rick. I love you, and I swear to God I trust you. Give me a chance to prove it, okay? A little dramatic? Hell yes she admitted. Did I believe her? Yes, I think I did. The makeup kiss that night was absolutely amazing. We dated throughout the rest of college. Sophie was a big support for me when things started to go wrong in my third year, twice in quick succession. No kidding. First, my grandfather died of a heart attack, followed soon after by my grandmother. No, she didn't die of a heart attack, she died of a broken heart because her husband was the love of her life. She just didn't want to live without him. If someone says that dying from a broken heart is a myth, I'd say, forget you. I know it's true. Coach Winston gave me two weeks to fly back to Boston and take care of my business. I also received special permission from my professors to allow me to catch up on work when I returned. The affairs were double funerals. Miss Murphy and Alicia helped, of course, God bless them. 
My grandparents had a decent amount of life insurance, and they named me as the sole beneficiary in their joint will. Alicia and I had become even closer than we were before. Miss Murphy never talked about her husband, but Alicia told me that her dad died when she was little, a drunk driver knocked him off the road, and he also died. Are you still hanging around these parts? I asked, making conversation after such heavy topics. No, I got a scholarship to C-Tech, she replied. I'm studying for a master's degree in engineering. Are you still going for computer science in Florida? Yes, I'm getting a bachelor's degree when I finish, I confirmed with a sad smile. A couple of MLB teams are looking at me as well. I just want my grandparents to be alive, not to mention my mom and dad. I just want to make them proud, you know? I know, honey, she sobbed, hugging me. I also want dad to be alive. But they're all in heaven now, looking at us and proud of us. You're right, I chuckled. Despite everything, I know they're proud of us. So, mom told me you have a boyfriend. Is he nice to you? Alicia asked, taking me by surprise. Yes, Sophie is amazing, I replied, a happy smile appearing on my face. She's absolutely gorgeous. I'm thinking about proposing to her. The first thing I saw on Alicia's face was surprise, followed by a look that I could not immediately identify. That's good, honey. I'm glad you found someone. You deserve happiness. Hey, what about you? Is there someone special in your life? I asked, smiling. Not at the moment, she said after a long pause. My last boyfriend turned out to be a terrible person, so no, and I'm not really looking right now. Sorry to hear that, sweetie, I replied, hoping she would find someone good soon. You deserve happiness too. Thank you, Rick. She gave me a bright smile, hugged me, and kissed me on the cheek. I have to go, but here's my number if you ever need anything, and I really mean anything, okay? Hey, same thing here, I told her sincerely. We exchanged numbers and programmed them into our phones. You need me, I'm there. She hugged me again, and I hugged her back. We said goodbye and went our separate ways. The lawyer read the will, and I inherited my grandparents' property. Only Miss Murphy was with me since Alicia took an early flight to Los Angeles. We said our goodbyes as she drove me to the airport for my flight back to Florida. Yes, I know what you're thinking. No, I didn't get too damn rich. I did inherit a fair amount of money despite the funeral expenses. I also inherited my grandmother's engagement ring, along with many other family heirlooms. I arranged for it all to be shipped to Florida. I rented a long-term warehouse there and stored everything until I graduated. You'd think I had suffered enough already, right? Well, it wouldn't be like that. No, I don't mean Sophie. I'm talking about my early career in baseball and how it ended at the damn whistle. And when I say at the damn whistle, I mean it literally. When I said everything happened quickly, I wasn't kidding. In my first game back, bang. We made it to the College World Series, and the first game was going well. I had already hit a double and a 2-RBI home run, and we were leading by 5 runs going into the ninth inning. Our pitcher threw a slider, and the batter sent the ball my way. They had runners on first and second base, so I ran as fast as I could. I had to run to the baseline to grab the ball and turn just in time for the runner to come at me with force. He knocked me down and stepped on my left kneecap as he ran past. This caused an involuntary whistle of pain to escape me. At least I kept the ball. Then, one day, while lying on my back, I threw it in the general direction of second base, and we made a double play. I found out later, when the game finally ended, that the referee kicked out the stupid idiot who had knocked me off my feet not to mention half of the bench as the substitutes rushed onto the field to fight. When the dust settled, my left leg was in a cast and in limbo at the university hospital and my girlfriend was sitting next to the bed, holding my hand. Then the doctor came in and told me the bad news. Oh yeah, the good news was that we won the game. Now for the bad news, my kneecap was shattered, along with extensive tendon and ligament damage. I faced the prospect of six months of rehabilitation, and that was after they inserted a new kneecap into me, one of those artificial knees made of titanium and silicone. I would be able to walk and even run a little, but I would never be able to play college baseball again. 
As for Major League Baseball? Yes, that's right. My baseball career ended on that field in Gainesville. Then I became a little depressed, and only Sophie kept me afloat. Sophie has been by my side every step of the way. She had completed her nursing degree and was now working as a nurse at the university hospital. She used a couple of connections to be assigned as my nurse, assisting the physical therapist with my recovery. Then she drove me home every night and made love to me, despite how much I felt sorry for myself. Immediately after the incident, she helped me through it all. I was glad the university didn't cancel my scholarship after my injury. It would have been terrible. But the coach calmed me down. He was just as disgusted as everyone else about what had happened. Well, everyone except the stupid idiot who stepped on my knee. He didn't seem to care. When we went to the ENA hearing on the incident, yes, Coach Winston filed a complaint with the ENA. But since Dwight Hollister was a rising star destined for MLB, the hearing was rather one-sided. He gave an insincere apology, and they let him off with a warning. After the hearing, he walked over to where I was standing with the coach and my ENA representative, then extended his hand. I squeezed it out of reflex, but he didn't let go while he spoke. Hey dude, sorry for accidentally stepping on you. You know it was an accident, right? I don't want us to have any misunderstandings. In response, I squeezed my hand tighter. He tried to squeeze my hand as he spoke, but my dad taught me to always extend my index and middle fingers along someone's wrist just in case. He took no such precautions, so I squeezed my hand tighter, telling him, karma is a mean good. Be careful now, Dwight. Then I let go of his hand, and he stepped back. This stupid idiot looked like he wanted to hit me. I think if it weren't for the coach and our representative, he might have tried. I was glad I chose a good career in case baseball didn't work out, which, as you can see, it didn't. So as soon as I finished my studies, I started making money as a freelancer in IT. Word spread quite quickly, and university students became some of my best clients. I also met Sophie's mother, Diana, and she immediately took a dislike to me. No matter what I said, she looked at me like I was the devil himself. I guess I was a Yankee devil to her after what her ex did. She stabbed me with her words every time she opened her mouth. You know what southern bells are like, right? If not, they may give you a compliment while insulting you. Damn it, I don't know how they do it, but they do. Finally, I got tired of it. Listen, Miss Sterling, I said tensely, addressing her by her maiden name. I'm not your stupid ex-husband. I'm not even from New York. I'm not going to cheat on your daughter. If you want me to leave, well, that's too damn bad. I love Sophie, and I'm not going anywhere. Diana looked shocked, and so did Sophie. No one talked to her mom like that, well, no one except the Irish hooligan from Southey. No one talks to me like that, young man, Diana said, still shocked. No one until now, I replied sharply. I've put up with your veiled insults for the last four damn hours, and I'm not going to take it anymore. I understand you think I'm not suitable for Sophie. I just want a chance to prove you wrong. If you don't give me this chance, it's still too damn bad. We've been together since our first year. I haven't cheated on her, and I never will. Okay, she said after a long pause. If you want a chance, you have a chance. Rick, you will not hurt my daughter in any way, and I swear to God Almighty, you will regret it. I acknowledge that, ma'am, I replied, extending my hand to her. We shook hands once nodded to each other, and that was it. Diana began to treat me much better after that day. She stopped with the biting compliments and small jabs. Now she was even friendly. Life started to get better. Sophie and I lived together for six months before I proposed. I had enough savings to organize a fairly nice but small wedding for her. As I prepared for the proposal, I continued my knee rehab and was finally able to get down on one knee with minimal pain. I surprised her when I pulled out a black velvet ring case and again when I smoothly lowered myself to my right knee. I didn't even blink when I opened the case and smiled at her. Sophie Randall, will you marry me? Her hand flew up to her face, and I saw tears running down her cheeks. Yes, yes. Oh God, yes, she exclaimed, jumping joyfully on the spot. Then she allowed me to put the ring on her left ring finger. Yes. 
I gave her her grandmother's engagement ring, which had given my grandparents 56 years of happy life until his heart attack and her death a week later. I hoped we could break that record. Diana took the news surprisingly well. Sunday dinners together after church with her and Sophie probably played a role in this. It was nice to know that she was finally starting to love me, if not trust me. Telling our friends, mostly her friends, was a mixed bag. Most of her friends already loved me, and most of her male friends were quite calm. However, Brad Douglas, Gerald Shoemaker, and Dwight Bagwell already hated me, and the news of our engagement only made the situation worse. You see, Dwight was Sophie's ex-boyfriend. She left him after a huge fight when she didn't want to sleep with him regularly. He thought that since he was her first, she was obligated to give him intimate whenever he wanted. She didn't see it that way, and he never came to terms with the breakup. Dwight also had a hard life. He said his mom died when he was a baby, leaving his jerk and overbearing father to raise him. So I think he came at it honestly. It didn't bother him that his dad was also the town sheriff. He got away with a lot of serious things, as Sophie told me. The situation was aggravated by the fact that the police started chasing me. Yes, you guessed it right. Dwight and his buddies were on the police force in the small town south of Gainesville where we all lived. So, soon after news of our engagement spread around town, the cops started chasing me. Yes, there are no connections between the sheriff dad and his son, right? Sophie, as a nurse, worked long hours at the hospital in Gainesville, and I sometimes worked odd hours as well. I continued my freelance work and was called upon at any time of the day or night to help someone with one issue or another. After finishing my studies, I was able to buy myself a nice car with cash. A local used car dealer sold me a 1969 Chevrolet Camaro for a reasonable price. I paid $5,000 for it. I took it to a local mechanic, and he was impressed with how well it was in good condition. It had some minor problems, but for $300, it was brought into excellent condition. It wasn't my first car, but it was definitely better than the old Honda Civic my dad left me when he died. I sold it for $200 before moving to Florida for school. Having this big muscle car was a blessing and a curse. While I was out of town, it was pure joy on the road. Every time I was in the city, I obeyed all speed limits. I always turned on my turn signals when changing lanes or turning, and finally, I was careful not to give Dwight or his henchmen a reason to stop me and give me a ticket. I'm sure you've noticed that I've known three dumbass named Dwight in my life. Well, they were all first-class jerks. I'm not saying all guys named Dwight are idiots, just everyone I knew. So I came up with nicknames for these three idiots. Brad became Deputy Dog, Gerald became the Detective, and Dwight became the Dak. This small town also has a kind of talisman. His name is Big Roscoe. In case you were wondering, this is the biggest damn alligator I've ever seen. Legend has it that he has lived here since the founding of the city more than a hundred years ago. I won't call anyone a liar on this, but he's so huge I wouldn't be surprised. Luckily, he stayed in his part of the swamp to the north of us, mostly near a nice pond where the road turns. If you take this turn too quickly, you could fly off the road and into Big Roscoe Pond. There are even warning signs. I got a good view of it one day while driving to Gainesville. I slowed down at the turn and looked to the left. Damn massive is an approximation of its size, but not entirely accurate. It's not as big as the alligator in that movie about the huge alligator in the lake, but it's still pretty darn huge. If I had to guess, Big Roscoe was at least 40 feet long, and his head was at least as long as I am 5 feet 11 inches tall. Yes, I tried to avoid dinosaurs as much as possible. Avoiding cavemen like Deputy Dog, Sleuth, and Dak wasn't that easy, they tried every possible way to make me mess up. They rode on my bumper, turned on the sirens and flashing lights and then drove around me. When I stopped, they even followed me home. Then they followed me to work if I was in the city the next day. I knew how to handle the damn pigs. Not all cops are pigs, but Dak and his gang definitely smelled like bacon. Some of our friends liked to drink after work in the evenings. I joined them one day, but when I saw Dwight driving by, I told the guys that I would have to miss this time. Of course, as soon as I got on the road, Dak pulled me over on suspicion of drunk driving. He got angry when I blew a clean breathalyzer. I just grinned at him, started my car, and gave it a little gas, 
but I drove under the speed limit the whole way home. I'm sick of your stupid ex and his trolls, baby, I said, sighing over dinner. D-bag stopped me as I walked out of lies this afternoon. I wasn't even drinking, but he stopped me and gave me a breath test, I said. I can't believe this idiot, Sophie said, also angry. Then she took a deep breath. I'll talk to him tomorrow, honey. If he doesn't leave you alone from now on, I'll report it to the sheriff myself. I don't care if he's his father, he's going to have to do something. She stood up and got me a bottle of Guinness from the refrigerator. I smiled and thanked her as she handed it to me. Yes, yes, I know my father died of alcohol poisoning. I'm Irish, you know. If we're not drinking, we're fighting or having a night, sometimes all of this in one night. But seriously, I don't drink like my dad did. I don't even come close to his level of devotion to the bottle. One beer a day is enough for me. Don't worry about Dwight and his boys, baby, Sophie said with a smile as I washed the dishes and put them in the dishwasher. She poured detergent into it, closed it, and turned it on. I'm not worried, but if they continue like this, I won't even complain. One thing I hate is damn dirty cops, I growled. I know it's tempting, but don't do anything that could land you in jail, honey, she warned me, lovingly stroking my cheek. Now go to bed and let me make you happy. Who am I to argue with that? Well, Dak and company finally backed down after Sophie gave them a solid kick in the butt. The only thing I heard from Dak before our wedding was that a real man fights his own battles, he doesn't let his woman fight for him. I had to muster all my willpower not to smash his damn head with a baseball bat, but I swallowed my pride and let the stupid idiot get away for once. We got married in Sophie's church. No one from Dak's company was invited, thanks to Diana and Sophie. I invited Miss Murphy and Alicia. Amelia arrived, and I introduced her to Sophie. They quickly became friends, especially when I told Sophie what Amelia and her daughter had done for me after my father died and then again after my grandparents died. Alicia was unable to come due to work in Los Angeles, but she sent her best wishes. In a break from tradition, as Sophie's father had not been seen or heard from for years, Diana walked her daughter down the aisle. I had not yet converted to the Baptist faith, but I think the Catholic faith was close enough. I was just glad Southern Baptist weddings aren't as long and boring as Catholic weddings. Before I knew it, we exchanged vows and rings and said I do. After a short reception, we headed off to Key West for our honeymoon. We spent the whole week making love. When we returned from our crazy honeymoon, life returned to normal. Sophie switched to day shifts at the hospital on her six-month rotation schedule, so we had more time for each other. We worked during the day and spent nights and weekends together, like most married couples. We knew we had some arguments, mostly over small things, nothing serious or life-threatening. The police were never called to our home because we pulled ourselves together, cooled down, and discussed problems like rational adults. It wasn't always easy, but I made the effort, Sophie did the same. I had a hot Irish temperament, and Sophie also had the hot redhead temperament. She wasn't of Irish descent, but I tried to put as much Irish into her as possible. Makeup into him is the best. Were we in a routine? No way! She would either do something to make our love life interesting, or I would come up with something new. One day, she asked me if I wanted to invite someone else to our bed. This could have turned into a huge fight if it had been serious. I had made my views on marriage clear before marriage. She laughed so hard at my expression that I couldn't stay mad at her for long. Yes, life was going pretty well, but you knew it had to end at some point, right? I did not know. I was an idiot. Do not misunderstand me. I didn't mess up. Something happened that I could not control. Just after our first anniversary, our idyllic life ended in epically bad fashion. It started out harmless. I was in Gainesville doing at-call work. The last call was on the university campus. I had just finished and left the dorm when I saw her, and she saw me. Was I surprised to see Alicia walking towards me with a huge smile on her face? Hell yes. I smiled and hugged her tightly. Damn it, girl. What are you doing here? I asked with a laugh. Engineering exhibition, she grinned pointing to the large banner above the auditorium doors. My employer sent me here to look at new equipment. 
It's not as big a show as the ones in Los Angeles and New York, but there's still some damn good stuff here. Hey, it's still great to see you, I said, hugging her again. She kissed me on the cheek, and I responded in kind. Are you in a hurry, or can you grab a bite to eat with me, she asked. I haven't eaten since breakfast, I looked at my watch. It was only four o'clock, so I still had time. Of course. Why not? I always have time for you. Great, she smiled. Come on, let's go to Burger King. We ate, talked, and laughed. We caught up, and she apologized for not being able to make it to the wedding. Don't worry about it, I chuckled. Would you like to come to our house and meet Sophie? I can call her and ask her to grab something to eat on the way home. Alicia looked at me with an expression I couldn't quite understand, then her face changed to one of regret. I wish I could, honey, but I need to go. My flight back to Los Angeles leaves in two hours. Next time, I promise. I was a little disappointed, but I tried to ignore it. No problem, honey. You should take a vacation soon. Come visit us. I know Sophie will love you, and I know you will love her. Her face became indifferent for a moment when I mentioned my wife, but then she was all smiles again, though with a sadder smile than before. Sounds great, Rick. I would like to someday. I'll call you, okay? Sounds great, Ollie. Let me know when, and we will prepare a guest room for you, I promised. I walked her outside, where a rental car was parked next to my Camaro. She looked at me and then threw herself into my arms. She hugged me so tightly that it became difficult for me to breathe. She then released me and gave me a quick kiss on the cheek. See you soon, Rick, she said as she got into the car. Yes, I hope so, I replied. Bye, Alicia. Bye, honey, she said, then pulled out of the parking lot and headed toward the airport. I wasn't sure, but I thought I saw a tear in her eye. Yeah, it's probably just the humidity here, I thought. Then I heard someone coughing, but when I looked, there was no one there. Damn it! Figure it out for yourself. I put it out of my mind. I drove home slowly, so you can imagine my surprise when I ran into Deputy Dog as I entered our city limits. I rolled my eyes, and he chuckled, gesturing for me to stop. All I could think about was, what the hell? Hi, Rick, he said, giving me his cheeky smile. We received an anonymous tip that a guy who looks like you, in a black and silver 69Z28, was seen making a deal selling illegal substances. Do you mind if I look at the car? Crap. I knew he was lying, but what could I do? I knew what I would do after that, but at that moment, I had to obey. Okay, deputy, just quickly, I said, a little irritated. I didn't even notice how he hit me. I opened the door and quickly walked out, ready to beat this redneck to the ground. No, no, Rick, he said, wagging his finger. I noticed that he was holding the handle of his weapon with his other hand. You want me to arrest you for assaulting a police officer, or maybe I'll just shoot you. What will you choose? Do you want me to show you what happens to the damn dirty cops here in South Sea? You an idiot. I replied. You attack me first, idiot. Take off your belt and fight like a man, or are you a cowardly man? Huh? Let's see. He grinned, not succumbing to my provocation. The word of an honest, upstanding law enforcement officer and southern gentleman against the word of a goddamn Yankee devil. Who do you think they'll believe, Rick? Okay, I said, stepping back for a moment. I raised my hands and shook my head. Do what you have to, deputy. I was going to file so many damn complaints against him that he would be happy if he got a dog catcher badge, I thought to myself. Damn it, I hope this stupid idiot can't read minds. Strangely, Deputy Dog did not find anything during the search, although he tore the trim in my trunk. He then headed to the back seat when his phone rang. I only heard his part of the conversation, yes. Yeah, fine. Let me get off work, and I'll meet you there. Bye. He then turned to me with a cheeky grin. You're free, Rick. Take care of yourself, do you hear? With that, he returned to his patrol car and sped off to the sheriff's station. I closed the trunk, got into the car, buckled up, and drove home.
When I arrived, I parked in the driveway next to Sophie's car. I was already mad as hell, but when I saw Dwight's patrol car parked on the street, I was ready to kill the stupid idiot. I left my laptop and tools in the car and ran to the door. I opened it to see Sophie sitting on the sofa, crying. Dak sat next to her, stroking her back. What the hell, Dwight? I growled. I thought we had this settled. The deputy dog just pulled me over and spent almost half an hour trying to find illegal substances in my car. You'll be lucky if you keep your damn badge after this crap. Why did you do that, Rick? Dwight asked, shaking his head regretfully. Why did you have to cheat on Sophie? Sophie looked up at me, and her expression of despair gave way to pure, undiluted rage. You are stupid, she screamed. What the hell? I shouted back. Will someone please explain to me what the hell is going on here right now? Sophie just grinned, looking at me like I was something that needed to be wiped off her shoe. She then took her phone and threw it at me. Look at this idiot! Black girl? Seriously? Damn black, I caught her phone and opened it to look at the photos. There, in full view, were photographs of me and Alicia near Burger King, one where we hugged and two where we kissed on the cheek. I looked at them both with anger. I didn't cheat on you with someone, Sophie. I shouted at my wife. This is Alicia Murphy. You dated her mother, Amelia. Remember? Alicia couldn't make it to the wedding, but she was here for the techno expo at the university. We grabbed a bite to eat and caught up. She's my best friend, damn it. Holy crap, do you really think I did this? I was about to continue, but then I felt a blow, and the light turned off. Damn blunt jerk. How did I not see this? Well, for starters, I thought those stupid hillbillies had backed down. No damn luck. I didn't know how long I was unconscious, but when I woke up, I found that I was tied to a chair. Before I could move, I heard them talking. Don't worry, we'll teach that damn Yankee something he'll never forget, Dak laughed. Are you sure you like this, Sophie? Punish this traitor, hell yeah! Sophie replied, laughing. I raised my head, and the sight shocked me to the core. There was Dak, Dog, and the detective on her bed with Sophie. Then let's get this party started, Dog said, looking at my wife. I don't remember what happened in the next hour or so. I'm sure my mind shut down to spare what was left of my sanity. My first clear thought after that initial shock was that Sophie tilted my head. She then turned and laughed at the three mans. Well, he's not dead yet, don't worry about it, Sophie said to Dog. He will be dead soon, I think we should tell him what's going on with the traitors here. He'll find out soon, Dak said, interrupting his friend. Sophie doesn't need to know. That's right, said Dog, suddenly becoming serious. He closed his mouth. So this punishment wasn't enough? I muttered, still trying to collect my thoughts and feelings. You know you're going to have to kill me, so why are you making me sit through this crap? All traitors deserve such punishment, Sophie spat, then she spat in my face. Sophie, for the hundredth time, I didn't cheat on you. I shouted back. Would you really believe these stupid idiots and not your own husband? You know they have been trying to set me up for a long time to get to you. Her face quickly changed from rage to horror. She turned her eyes to Dwight and the other two. Is this true, Dwight? She asked, her expression changing to realization. Hell no, Sophie, Dwight replied. We've known each other all our lives. Do you think I would do this to you? It was a coincidence that Gerald was in Gainesville when he saw that damn Yankee with a black. Do you think we could plan this? Sophie then turned her accusing gaze towards me. He's got a point, you an idiot, she hissed at me. Only because it was a damn coincidence. I hissed back. That doesn't mean he didn't take advantage of an innocent situation to turn it to his advantage. He just had a night with you, something he's been wanting to do for a long time. All three of these freaks just had an intim with you, Sophie. No matter how it ends, our marriage is over. You didn't trust me. Again, I don't think you ever trusted me, despite what you said. If the photos were of me with some without anything girl in bed, you'd be right, but they didn't have that on, did they? Sophie looked like she was starting to have doubts, but Dwight spoke up. 
Gerald, shut that damn Yankee devil up. Dwight commanded, grinning. Let me go and see how long you can hold out, the detective I challenged, preparing for a new fight. I was really hoping that stupid man would take the bait. It's a shame he wasn't as dumb as he looked. Instead, he hit me. This time he didn't knock me out, but I didn't let him know that. Maybe he's telling the truth, Sophie said. Dwight, maybe it really is all as innocent as he said. No, that's not true, Gerald intervened, now lying. I saw them leaving Motel 6, and then I followed them to Burger King. They left from the same room, Sophie. I wanted to scream that it wasn't true, but I had nothing left to fight for. Well, except for your life. The fact that Sophie accepted their words and the innocent photos of two friends hugging instead of my words, after all our talk about trust, boggles my simple, selfy mind. This also meant that our marriage was truly over. I was released from the handcuffs and moved to the passenger seat of my car. The bag explained the plan. They were going to get rid of me at Big Roscoe Pond and make it look like an accident. Dog and Gumu followed directions, but on the way to the site, I pretended to be unconscious. When we arrived, I suddenly attacked them, taking advantage of the moment when Dog uncuffed me. A struggle ensued, during which we were interrupted by an alligator from the pond, which grabbed Dog. Gumu was hit by an accidental shot, and I used that to free myself from the handcuffs. I tried to help Gumu, but he didn't survive. Realizing that I had no chance of avoiding murder charges, I decided to flee the city. I got into my car and drove away, leaving the past behind and planning my next steps. I didn't want to, but I ran. I was running. I drove north to Gainesville and got my phone out. I called Dwight. What the hell are you calling from this idiot's phone? The bag asked furiously. The phone should have drowned in the pond just like me. You stupid pig. I growled back. When he took a breath to answer, I interrupted him. Don't talk, idiot. Just listen. Your boys tried to kill me tonight. Luckily for me, Big Roscoe likes the taste of bacon better than Irish sausage. Now I'm leaving. If you try and somehow find me, I will kill you. I know one thing for sure, Pigman. You won't last in South Sea five minutes. Before he could say a word, I ended the call turned off the phone, and tossed it into the passenger seat. Damn, that was nice. While I was driving, anger was seething inside me. The pain I was experiencing kept me on my toes. Who should you direct your anger at? Everyone in this damn country town that I called home for the past two years. Yes, I knew that most of them were honest, hard workers, but it didn't change the fact that the whole damn town was as corrupt as the Irish Mafia in South Boston. If the whole damn sheriff's office is going to allow this to happen, something has to be done. Then I felt terrible because I knew there was nothing I could do about it. That's when I transferred my anger to Sophie. It was something of a double whammy. She was a victim just like me, only she accepted the role of the victim. In the end, she trusted those mans more than her own husband. Yes, she had known them all her life, but she also knew that they hated me. She knew that they would do anything to set me up simply because I spoke without their accent. Add to that the fact that they always hated me for being with Sophie, and there you have it. It all came down to a lack of trust, rooted in her father cheating on her mother. She said she trusted me, but when it came down to it, she trusted these idiots more than her own husband. Then something clicked in my head. I took the phone and turned it on again. There were several missed calls from Dwight and one from Sophie of all people. Hmm. I ignored it for now, but dialed Diana's number. She answered on the second ring. Hi, Rick, she said. What made you call so late, dear? Something bad? Diana, I replied. No matter what anyone tells you, I didn't cheat on Sophie. You gave me one chance, and I took it. There's something I need to know. Um, what are you talking about? Rick asked. I heard caution in her voice but continued, Did you see with your own eyes how your ex-husband cheated on you? Did you personally see it? I asked, acting on a hunch. She was silent for several moments. I guessed that she was thinking back to the time when this happened. No, Tim Bagwell, Dwight's father, told me, but I trust him. I know he wouldn't lie to me about something like that. Yes, of course, I snorted. 
It's not that I don't believe you, but you can't trust anything these Dwights say. Diana, Dwight just ordered Dog, Sorry, Brad, and Jerry to try and kill me. They tried to feed me to Big Roscoe. What? She gasped. If today was April 1st, I wouldn't believe you. Even now, I'm not sure I do. What are you talking about, Rick? I took a deep breath, then detailed the events of the day and evening to my very puzzled mother-in-law. I'm telling the honest truth, Diana, I finished. I thought Sophie really trusted me, but she believed those idiots in innocent photos of me and my friend, mistaking them for something more. You mean she let them, oh God, she gasped, her voice trembling. They, Dwight's dad and his friends did the same thing when Carter came home that day, she admitted, her voice shaking. They said they were doing it for me to make me feel attractive after finding out my husband was cheating on me. They said they knew I wanted to get back at him. Diana, I said softly, I know this is hard, but do you know exactly what happened to Carter? He was so upset that he left in the middle of the night, she admitted. At least that's what they told me. He didn't even pack anything, he just got in the car and drove away. I divorced him for abandonment, but I haven't heard from him since that night. Now it was my turn to take a deep breath to calm down. Diana, I think they fed into Big Roscoe like they planned to do to me tonight. Oh my god, she gasped again as the full weight of what I had just told her hit her. Diana, I know this sounds far-fetched, but I have a gut feeling that I'm right, I continued. You need to talk to Sophie and get out of town. Brad and Jerry became Roscoe's dinner because of me. That means Dwight can take his anger out on Sophie or you. I've known mans like him, they don't like to lose. I'll do my best, Rick. You can count on it, she replied, her voice becoming determined. Besides, I can't be married to Sophie anymore, I said, telling her the other bad news. After what she did tonight, there's no turning back. I'm sorry but I can't forget what she did. Maybe I can forgive her someday, but it won't be any time soon. Even if I can forgive, I won't forget. I know she thought she was right, but that's no excuse for being cruel to someone you claim to love. You're right, Rick, she said sadly. I'm sorry this happened. Me too, I replied. Just get yourself and your daughter out of town. Tell her to file for divorce on the grounds of abandonment, like you did with your ex. I'm going to disappear. Okay, I'll try, honey, she replied. Can you tell me where you're going? No, even if I knew, I answered, feeling my heart break even more. I don't know where I'll end up, but even when I get there, I won't mess with you or Sophie. I'm sorry, D. I love you, despite the way you treated me. For what it's worth, I love you too, Rick, she replied, holding back sobs. Be careful, you hear? Yes, ma'am, I said with a sad smile. Take care of yourself too. Get as far away from these idiots in this town as possible. Oh, and tell Sophie that everything except my business account is hers. She might put the house up for sale or something. Goodbye, Diana. I'll tell you goodbye, Rick, she said, and we ended the call. Anger was still boiling inside me, pushing despair into the background. Again. I turned off the phone and threw it on the passenger seat. I had already passed Gainesville, heading northeast toward I-75. I had a long way to go, and I didn't know where I was going yet. Sophie. God, I felt used. How could I let Dwight, Brad, and Jerry do all this to me? I felt terrible. Even after two showers, Dwight had just left after receiving a call. He was furious, so he quickly got dressed and left. I locked the door behind him, and that's when I started to feel used. It was so vindictive and nasty what I did to Rick. He deserved it, really. I saw those photos where he hugs and kisses that girl. I didn't care about her skin color, despite what I said. When Rick tried to deny it, I knew Dwight and Jerry wouldn't lie to me about something like that. Or would they? Oh my god. I didn't know. I shuddered, thinking about what I had just done. Rick was right about at least one thing, after all our talk about trust, I did the same thing I did when I saw him hugging Kate in college. No, I did much worse than when I saw him with Kate. That time, I even gave my consent for Rick to be thrown into the pond with Big Roscoe. Oh my god, I couldn't hold back my tears, 
covering my face with my hands and sobbing. What have I done? I cried. Then my phone rang, and I saw it was my mother. I took a deep breath and answered. Hi, Mom. Sophie Jean, you need to pack your things and come to me right now, Mom ordered. Clothes, toiletries, everything you need for a long vacation. Not in the morning? Now I knew this tone all too well. Mom knew that something serious was happening, besides what had already happened. I wonder what it could be. Mom, you're scaring me. What's going on? I asked, feeling afraid. Damn it, Sophie Jean. Pack your things and get your skinny fifth place over here. Mom screamed. Okay, I'll come as soon as I pack my things, I said, giving in to my mother's demands. I grabbed my suitcase and started packing, panties, bras, tights, skirts, shorts, jeans, and blouses went into the suitcase. Mom sounded scared, and it scared me. I didn't know what happened, but I was going to find out. I pulled my suitcase and duffel bag with toiletries from my old Chrysler car, threw them in the trunk, and drove to my mom's. She came out to meet me when I arrived. I was surprised that she was also hurriedly packing her suitcase and bag. Mother? I asked, getting out of the car. Open the trunk, she said. I reached into the car to press the trunk release. She threw her things into the trunk and sat in the passenger seat. What are you waiting for, Sophie Jean? Get in, and let's go. I sat down and fastened my seatbelt. Where to, Mom? To hell if I know, she sobbed, tears streaming down her face. Miami, Key West, anywhere but here. Okay, I said, starting the car and putting it in reverse. I left her yard and turned south. Will you tell me what's going on? Mom, Rick warned me, she said simply. Honey, I don't think your father left us, and now I don't think he really cheated on me. I was so stunned by this that I almost crashed the car. Mom, why do you think that? First of all, did you tell these guys they could throw your husband in Big Roscoe Pond? Now I had to pull over and put the car in park because I was sobbing uncontrollably. Did you say that, Sophie? She asked softly. Yes, but I didn't think they'd actually do it. I cried. I didn't even know they were planning it. I thought they were joking. You know damn it, Sophie Jean. Mom screamed. Then she took a deep breath to calm herself. You know Dwight doesn't joke about stuff like that. Well, Rick is alive and you'll probably never see him again. I think you know deep down that he would never cheat on you. Your trust issues are basically my fault. I filled your head with the idea that all men cheat if given half a chance. I gave that boy a hard time, but I know that he loved you and me so much that he warned me to take you out of town. Jerry and Brad are dead because they tried to kill Rick. This stunned me even more. I looked at my mother in horror, realizing that I had actually signed my husband's death warrant. Did he tell you where he went? Maybe to Boston? No, and he said he didn't know where he was going, Mom shook her head. But even if he knew, he wouldn't tell me. I think he's going to move as far away from here as possible. He told you to put the house up for sale, he's not coming back. I took out my phone and tried to call Rick again. I felt terrible, and I had to make sure he was okay. I knew we would never get back together, but I still loved him as before. The call went to voicemail. I hung up without leaving a message. This time, honey, listen to me, mom said. We have to go now. When Dwight gets back, he'll be furious. Now go. A new sense of determination washed over me, and I let out one last sob before stepping on the gas. You're right, mom. We need to go somewhere safe. This damn town isn't safe anymore, if it ever was. Okay. I think we should go to Miami, honey. I can find a job as a secretary, and there are a lot of hospitals there that need good nurses. Rick said he left you everything except his business account. My advice is to file for divorce on the grounds he mentioned and let him go. We can handle it, do you hear? Okay, mom, I replied, barely able to contain myself. I lost the best man I ever knew because of my lack of trust. I had to hold on. Of course, we didn't want Dwight to find us after what happened to his two best friends. I just hoped Rick would be okay. Rick. 
I don't remember much. Actually, I drove on autopilot until I reached I-10 and turned west. I had to get out of Florida. I could have gone north to Boston, but I had almost nothing there except Miss Murphy. No, I needed a clean break. I had to disappear. Maybe if I were a Marine or a Navy SEAL, I could take a team of other highly trained marksmen and try to bring order to that city, just like those old movies where former Green Berets bring order to a corrupt town. But life is not like that. That damn city was as corrupt as many others, or at least that's how the sheriff's office was. When law enforcement is corrupt, it's likely that the rest of the government is too. I found this out in South Boston, where the Irish Mafia rules, and the police turn a blind eye. Of course, the O'Hara family has brought some order, and they run a relatively clean operation. But when another group comes for a piece of the pie, the street wars turn bloody very quickly. I stopped for gas and washed my face in the bathroom sink. I grabbed some snacks, bought a cooler, and every bottle of Mountain Dew voltage I could find, then got back behind the wheel, heading west. I checked my watch and saw that it was already after midnight. I wasn't tired, so I drove west on the interstate and ended up in Alabama. I finally got tired enough to stop in Mobile for the night and paid cash for a room at a Motel 6. But four hours later, I was on the road again. I found my bank branch and cleared my business account. I had saved half of my income in this account for future expenses, and there was already over $880,000 in it since I opened it my senior year in Florida. I closed the account and put all the cash in the duffel bag I had bought. The vandalism in my trunk worked to my advantage, as I could hide a small duffel bag under the trim where he had torn it. I got behind the wheel again and drove through Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. I drove like crazy, stopping only for gas and snacks, that is, until I almost fell asleep behind the wheel on the outskirts of Las Cruces, New Mexico. I found another Motel 6 and paid cash for another room for the night. The next day, I made it to Phoenix, Arizona. I realized that I needed new clothes, as my current jeans, polos, and underwear were starting to smell noticeably. So, I got another room, this time at a Super 8 in the West Valley I-10, showered again, and went looking for new clothes. I found the nearest Walmart and shopped for a new suitcase, t-shirts, jeans, shorts, socks, boxers, shoes, everything I needed. I paid for everything in cash, of course, I didn't want to leave any electronic traces. Yes, I may have overestimated Dwight's intelligence in finding me, but better to be safe. Part of me, a big part of me, wanted him to find me. I would see it from afar and act accordingly, in other words, I would kill him. It's been too long since I've been in a real fight. Yes, I know about the Irish hooligan stereotype, actually, it's true. I'd rather kick the stupid man than listen to his idiotic talk. If you're not Irish, you won't understand what it was like for me. I should have been polite to the three idiots when they followed me in Florida when every instinct screamed at me to kick their asses and beat the crap out of them. Ever since I left Florida, I've been getting stares all the time, starting from the very first time I refueled. My face looked like something out of a horror movie due to the bruises from the beating. However, by the time I got to Arizona, the bruises had faded a little, but I still caught glances as I shopped for essentials at Walmart. A woman approached me in the aisle with toothpaste and toothbrushes. Are you okay? She asked. I'm fine, thanks for your concern, I replied, then smiled. Believe me, the other guys don't look any better. She simply patted my hand and nodded. I hope you get better soon. Then she left. It may seem strange, but this woman seemed to restore my faith in people. After all the crap I've been through, I really needed this. Oh and I had to buy a new phone. I bought a cheap phone and a monthly card for cricket. That was enough for now. When I returned to the hotel room with all my purchases, I sat down and thought about everything that had happened over the past three days. In 72 hours, I lost my wife, friends, and home in Florida. I almost became food for the prehistoric monster that once starred in that movie about the Dino Park. Oh, and I might now want the FBI. Yes. I was still in pain, but I didn't become gator fodder, which was good. I took the good with the bad, and that helped a little. I began to think more clearly, so I took care of some necessary things. First, I took a shower and scrubbed myself squeaky clean. 
I applied new deodorant, brushed my teeth, rinsed my mouth, and put on new clothes. After looking in the mirror and combing my hair, I began to feel human again. Who would have thought? Then I sat on the bed and activated my new phone. I connected it to the charger, entered the time code from the card, and checked the number. Then I put it aside and did some necessary things with the old phone. First, I sent a mass message to all contacts in my customer folder, informing them that I would no longer be able to provide support. I simply explained that I had to leave the state and would not be returning. Then I recommended the competitor I respected the most as my replacement. I'm sure Kurt will appreciate it. Then an idea came to mind. Now that I was thinking more clearly, I made one last call from the old phone. She called three times before she answered. Rick, how are you, dear? Alicia. I was pleasantly surprised. It's been better, honey, I answered tiredly. The anger began to subside, and so did my pain tolerance. I hate to ask, but I need a favor. Whatever, Rick. You know that. What can I do? I need you to recommend a place to stay. I'm in Phoenix now and will be in Los Angeles tomorrow. Oh God, what happened? Is Sophie with you? Are you okay? What's going on? Alicia began asking questions at breakneck speed. Well, the point is this, I began, and then I told her everything. When she heard that someone had taken photos of us at Burger King, she gasped. When I explained how those photographs were used to turn Sophie against me, she cried out in disbelief. What the heck? She exclaimed. Why would someone do something like that to you? I then explained how and why, as best I could understand. She gasped in disbelief again, then I explained how it all played out in the end, including how I almost became dinosaur food. She laughed when I said that, luckily, Roscoe liked the taste of bacon better, that's why I had to run. I began to conclude that I warned my mother-in-law to take herself and her daughter away because I knew my life was worth nothing anymore. I know Dwight. He's a vindictive man. No matter how much I wanted her out of my life, no one deserves what he does to her when he can't find me. I understand, honey. Okay, you can stay with me, Alicia said. When I started to object, she interrupted me. Listen carefully, Rick. You're staying with me, and that's final. Okay, I gave in. Give me your new number. This phone is mine, I'll throw it away, I said. I gave her my new number and sent her a message to prove it. Okay, I got it, she said. I'll send you my address on the new phone. If I'm not home when you arrive, the key is under the big stone in the garden by the front door. Thank you, Alicia, I said, smiling despite everything. You're welcome, dear. There is a small condition. As my neighbor, you will help with the house payments. I'll do it, I promised. Don't worry, once I get my freelance business up and running again, everything will be fine. There's one thing, though. Oh, I'm afraid to ask. Well, you remember those idiots who tried to feed me to the giant alligator? Since they were cops, there might be consequences. I'm not sure the local sheriff would go that far, but he may or may not have notified the FBI about me. Okay, well, we'll deal with it. If something happens, stop worrying so much, Rick. Okay, I'll stop worrying so much, I snorted in response. Thanks again, Ollie. No more thanks, dear, she replied with a chuckle. Just drive carefully. See you tomorrow. Okay, see you tomorrow, I said and ended the call. I fell onto the bed, and then my new phone rang. I took it and opened the message. I saw Alicia's text, she sent her address. I remembered the address in Santa Monica and saved her number in my contacts under the name Alicia. After checking the new phone to make sure everything was okay, I took the old phone and removed the SIM card. Then I broke it in half and threw it away. As I lay back down on the bed, I closed my eyes for a moment. I wanted a drink, something stronger than beer. Then it dawned on me, I finally understood how my father felt after losing his mother. I used to cry a little, but now, after everything that has happened recently, I had finally released my grief. I'm not ashamed to admit that I wallowed in self-pity until I cried, died, and fell asleep. I woke up as the sun came through the east-facing window the next morning. Damn, I was hungry, 
I hadn't eaten anything since the last day when I had a burger and fries at a Carl's Jr. restaurant. I knew it as Hardee's back east. Despite my growling stomach, I felt better, much better, in fact. Self-pity, it turned out, was its own form of therapy. Who would have thought? With a smile on my face, I gathered all my new clothes and belongings, grabbed my gym bag, and made sure I didn't forget anything. I then handed over my key card to the front desk and left. I smiled as I put everything in the car, got in, started it, and headed toward the highway. As I entered I-10, I plugged the cassette player adapter into my MP3 player and turned on a Metallica classic. Got to love the 50 gigabytes of storage for music. I had a significant collection. I hadn't listened to music the entire trip until this point. Now I felt good enough to listen to something. As soon as the song Creeping Death started playing, I smiled and began bobbing my head to the music. The trip took almost seven hours, including stops for gas and food. I used the Maps app on my new phone to get directions to Alicia's house and arrived a little after two in the afternoon. Great, it was Saturday. I hoped she was home. The curbside parking lot near her house showed two cars, and her driveway probably had her boyfriend's. I thought out loud, looking in the mirror, my face hadn't healed completely yet. Oh well, she's seen me beaten before, no need to worry about it now. I turned off the engine and got out of the car, closing the door. I spent a minute stretching to loosen my stiff muscles before heading toward her house. First, I wanted to say hello and then pick up my things. I walked along the sidewalk and around the entrance, I didn't want to leave marks on this green lawn. Walking up to the door, I rang the bell, and it opened. Okay, maybe not a guy. The girl who answered the door was damn hot. Um, hi, I said, stunned. Is Alicia here? Damn, I sounded like a kid asking if his friend could come out to play. I almost laughed at the situation, but instead, I just smiled. Of course, she nodded, looking at me appraisingly. Just a second. Then she turned and called, Alicia. Hey girl, there's some white guy asking for you. My name is Rick, I said. Some white guy named Rick came to see you, she shouted into the house again, and then I heard quick steps approaching us. Alicia rushed past her friend, throwing herself around my neck. Oh, I sighed, staggering back as Alicia wrapped her arms around my neck. Easy, Ollie, I'm not in the best shape right now. The tension in my voice must have made her realize I was in pain because she quickly stepped back and gasped when she saw my face. Oh God, honey, what happened? It happened during that fight I told you about, remember? I said, trying to be evasive since there were other people around. I glanced pointedly at the attractive girl standing nearby, smiling at us. Alicia followed my gaze. Karis, what are you doing? She asked. Enjoying the show, girl, Karis responded, smiling as I extended my hand. I'm Alicia's cousin, Rick Donnelly. I introduced myself. Nice to meet you, ma'am. I didn't know Alicia had cousins. On my father's side, Alicia explained. She's my aunt's daughter. Come on, Rick, let's get your things inside so we don't have to do it later. Karis was cute, but Alicia was in a league of her own. As we all walked back to my car, Karis whistled and nodded approvingly. Nice car, she said, glancing at me again. I like classic cars. I'll have to give you a ride sometime, I replied with a shrug, then winced from the pain. Alicia and Karis both laughed. What's so funny about my injuries? I asked, a little annoyed, as I opened the trunk and pulled out a duffel bag full of cash. I made a mental note to take it to the bank first thing in the morning. That's not the point, honey, Alicia giggled. Hey, you're a really nice guy, Rick, but I play for the other team, Karis explained. I immediately understood what she meant. Well, if I were a woman, you'd be in trouble, I joked, flashing a charming smile. It's a pity because I love being a man, I added. Okay, enough flirting, Mr. Blarney Stone, Alicia chuckled, rolling her eyes. Kiss me, I'm Irish, I teased. Maybe later, honey, she replied flirtatiously, winking, which set off another round of laughter from Karis and me. With my gym bag and toiletry kit, Alicia dragging my suitcase, and Karis watching, we headed back to the house.
Alicia showed me to my room while Karis returned to watching TV. I noticed that the room had an ensuite bathroom. I dropped my bags on the floor and turned to Alicia. Are you giving me the master bedroom? I asked in surprise. If you want to think so, Alicia smiled. All the bedrooms in the house have ensuite bathrooms. I know I don't say this enough, but I love you, Ollie, I said, smiling again. I opened my arms, and she came over so we could hug. God knows I needed as many hugs as I could get at that time. Just not too tightly, those could wait until my body healed. What do you think of our story today? In my opinion, the first part of the story was quite interesting and unusual in that it involves the discovery of infidelity. What was your impression? Write in the comments. See you in the comments.